Hi, folks. Jason Webster, lead commercial agronomist with Precision Planning. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, a, a little while back, we sent an email out to all of our Inside PTI subscribers, and we simply asked a question, what do you have on your mind? What are you thinking about right now as we're finishing up the 2024 season and thinking about getting in and starting the 2025 growing season? And we said, send us the questions that you guys have, and and uh, we might air some of them on Inside PTI. And that's what we're doing here today. We had a ton of questions come in, and I thought I'd share some of the questions with you today and try to answer some of them as well. The first question uh, comes in from Silvio, and he says, how many types of liquid fertilizer can I add to my planter with precision planting attachments? And Silvio, that's a great question. Here's one of our planters at the PTI farm. We've got three tanks and three pumps on this planter. And, and I get teased sometimes by growers saying, Jason, that's a lot of stuff happening on the planter. You've got a lot of tanks and pumps. It's hard enough to get one tank and pump to work, let alone three. And I get it, but bear with me here. Kind of check out what we're doing here. We're building a foundation and there's some really good fertilizer and, and some other type products that we want to put on the planter, but we have to place them properly. Not all of them can just go in one spot and be real effective. So we have multiple tanks, multiple pumps for multiple placements to get the job done right. We have FurrowJet center application. So FurrowJet is an interesting tool that has three points of application. One of them in the center of the trench, place the seed on the seed between the seed. And a lot of times those are sugars and biologicals, very, very seed safe products. But then as we tradition into normal fertilizer, We'll use FurrowJet wings. It's going to be three quarters of an inch off to the side and higher. So we can use maybe a little bit saltier of a fertilizer or maybe even look at some higher rates, but uh, much safer getting it out of the, out of the, the furrow next to the seed. And then my third tank and pump, I'm, I'm set up with Conceal. And this is going to be for the saltier type products like nitrogen, potassium, sulfur, and boron. And this placement is going to be three inches away from where the seed is in the trench. And typically, we're going about an inch and a half deep. Not a real deep placement on this, but gives us tremendous flexibility with this product. We can put a lot of products and be very, very uh, seed safe. The, the backside of that question was, uh, if I had to choose, this was from Michael, if I had to choose one of these systems and only one to go on the planter, which one would I choose? Most of the time, I'm going to say I'm going to choose Conceal just because for corn planting, I, I love having the nitrogen component to this to help get that corn off to a great start. We have a potassium issue here at the PTI farm. We're trying to build K levels up. So putting potassium on the planter is very advantageous. Sulfur, I'm not only using sulfur in corn, but I'm using it on soybeans as well. It's been a great way to increase soybean yield and we're applying it through conceal. So lots of flexibility and it's not just one crop, it's multiple crops. Um, so most of the time I would choose conceal if you're going to force me just to use one attachment on the planter. Great questions. Another one comes in from Brandon. Is tillage needed to be done ahead of corn on soybean stubble? Great question. We're studying uh, different tillage methods here at the PTI farm. We'll look at primary tillage, running a disc ripper in the fall, very heavy, aggressive tillage. And then we work our way down. We reduce tillage. Uh, we're looking at strip till. It's, it's probably the number one percentage of acres on the PTI farm here in Pontiac. We really like what strip till has to offer. I'll show you data here in a minute. We reduce tillage down even further. We're looking at vertical tillage. It's a huge trend or fad in the industry right now. And then the ultimate goal is to take all the tillage away and just look at no-till um, in our tillage study here at the farm. I pulled multi-year data. This has got brand new 2024 data in it as well. But 18 to 2024. Uh, this is from the, the lifespan of the PTI farm here in Pontiac. And strip till is our winner. And as we look at the, the cost of each tillage program in comparison to strip till, vertical till is about $27 off the base, $20 and change. Uh, no till is our largest deficit at over $25. And conventional till comes in at minus $17 an acre. And I will note on this, we're using Land Grant University custom machinery costs. For, you know, because every tillage program has a cost. Some it's more horsepower and fuel. Others are less horsepower and fuel, but more of a burn down 
for weed control since we're not doing much tillage. But all, nonetheless, all those factors are built in to all four of these tillage programs. Another question rolls in. Have you seen any benefit to using an automated downforce system in soybeans? And this is coming from Jonathan. Yeah, Jonathan, um, we're using our Delta Force downforce system uh, on every single planter we have here at the farm. Um, you know, with soybeans, to, in answer to your question, to get high yield soybeans, I need to plant them at the right depth, keep them at a consistent depth, and get them to come up uniformly. And in order to do that, I have to have the right ground contact on the row unit to, to achieve that. And, and here's some data. It's 2020 to 2024. You can see the yield deficit in soybeans where we're too shallow or too light versus too heavy. Heavy. What does all this mean? Well, let's just put the dollars and cents to it. When we've been light on our feet, too light a downforce in that row unit's coming up, we're losing almost $21 an acre in soybeans. On the other side, when we're too heavy, okay, we've got too much weight on the row unit, we're, we're sacrificing about $11 an acre. So in general, this data would say that if you have to hedge your bet in any one direction being too light or too heavy, we'd probably say be on a little bit on the heavier side unless you're in some really heavy soil or wet conditions. All right, another question rolls in from Tim. Tim says, we have a tremendous amount of soil variability. Could you please help explain multi-hybrid corn planting? Yeah, Tim, multi-hybrid corn planting is near and dear to my heart. It's, it's the only way I know how to plant the right corn hybrid on the right acre to maximize production. And it, it's, it's been some big numbers for us. As we look at top ROI winners here at PTI a year ago, um, this one was in our top 10. So this one can add up to some dollars if we do it right. What is multi-genetic planting? Let's not make it real difficult here. It's planting the most appropriate genetics to every acre, matching its environment and maximizing production potential. And it's just about knowing whether you have soil variability. And if you do, spatially, let's find it. And then as you talk to a seed salesman who's trying to sell you seed, he may, he may say to you, he probably will, that placement is key. And I agree with that statement, but the problem is, how do you do it? Without technology on the planter, I don't know that we can plant the right genetics on every single acre to maximize production. We've got technology on the planter. In 2014, we came out with VSET Select. This is single row dual meter technology. We've got two meters on every single row. We turn one on and one off to plant the right corn hybrid that we have on the planter. We're locked and loaded with two hybrids. We go to our CCS tanks. I like to think of this as maybe a more offensive type hybrid in one tank and more of a defensive hybrid in one tank. And then we change that hybrid selection as we travel through that soil variability in the field. It's really quite easy. We also have the ability at the same time of changing corn hybrid, we can do variable rate seeding as well, which in, in tandem or in combination, I think these two are pretty powerful as we address soil variability. In 2017, we released um, a, a new multi-genetic corn planting technology in MSET for those folks who maybe wanted to shift away from VSET Select to bring in high-speed planting into the mix. So now we can change corn hybrid, we can change corn seeding rate, and we can actually plant it fast. So now it comes down to identifying soil variability. Here's a um, a, a field at the PTI farm. We, we know we've got differences in organic matter, which means differences in water holding capacity, which leads to yield differences. Knowing that, I can go in and then work with my seedsmen to find the perfect corn hybrid to plant on each and every acre. This is what it comes down to. This is data from 18 to 2024 where we've implemented this placement is key mentality and planting the right corn hybrid on the right acre. And we didn't get it right every single time. You'll notice on the offensive side and the defensive side, I was wrong one time in each of the seven years. I screwed up and, and chose the wrong uh, corn hybrid. Maybe the weather didn't, didn't agree with us that year as well. However, if you look at getting it right six times, and getting it wrong one time, those are some really good odds. And that's what farming is all about, is how can you increase your odds of not giving up yield and making more dollars 
on a per acre basis. We've done that with multi-genetic planting. Our average uh, yield gain is about 11 bushel. And with that, the average revenue gain is near $50 an acre. And that's an important number because we talk about this all the time at the PTI farm. What can you do on your farm to make another $50 an acre? This is a technology that can do it for us. So if you've got soil variability, this is a great way to capture yield and capture net return. Another question rolls in from James. James says, how much yield can we gain with proper seed orientation in the furrow? And I kind of laugh at this question, James, because each and every spring, I've got a, an army of college interns that really hate this study involving seed orientation. We use our interns to be planters for us, and they go in and they plant seed in different directions in the trench. And why are we doing this? Well, it comes down to how a corn kernel wants to germinate. And I always say that there's very few things in life that happen 100% of the time. But the way a corn kernel germinates, it happens the same 100% of the time, every time. And as you look at the picture here, you're going to see two corn kernels. One of them on the left is positioned tip down. Now, if you look at that corn kernel, Every corn kernel has an embryo on one side of the seed. That embryo is what's going to imbibe water, soil moisture, right? And it's going to start to germinate. When that happens, the coley up tile, when you position a corn kernel straight tip down in the furrow, that coley up tile will start to germinate upward. My question to you, is that the right direction? Yes, it is. You want that corn to get up out of the ground. You want that coley up to reach the soil surface as fast as it can. And so when you plant a corn kernel tip down, that coley up to it's a straight shot to the soil surface. It's the fastest way to emergence. However, if you take that corn kernel and you flip it upside down, now you got the tip facing straight up. Well, that embryo is going to imbibe water. The coley up is going to shoot, but she's going to grow the wrong way. That coley up is going to be going down. And the neat thing about a corn kernel is it'll figure it out. It'll know it's growing. You know, that coley up is growing in the wrong direction, and it will simply do a U-turn. It'll U-turn and start growing the other direction to get up to the soil surface. The problem with this is it takes time and it takes energy. And a lot of times in the spring, while that corn's trying to come up, we have cold, wet conditions, and this could result in a late emerger. And we all know what that can do for us. This could be ultimately a weed down the road. So it's interesting to look at how we place the seed in the trench, how we can get the fastest, most uniform emergence. Again, we're using interns to plant this, and it's not a very fun study to do each and every spring. But it is interesting to see how the corn kernel does react the way it's placed in the trench. And what are some of the numbers? I guess we're always flag testing in the spring, and I hope you guys are doing some of this too. And you know, from the time that first corn plant comes up out of the ground, my expectation for the rest of the corn plants in the row is you've got 12 hours to get up out of the ground as well. And some interesting data from this spring is where we planted our corn kernels tipped down, we received 99% 12-hour emergence. That's pretty good. I don't know that I've had many uh, trials that high of 12-hour emergence. When we took that corn kernel and flipped it backwards with the tip going straight up, my 12-hour emergence fell to 90%, a 10% difference. And why am I saying this? Well, we're, we, we've been monitoring you know, emergence timing uh, for years. This is 2020 to 2023 emergence data. Again, I'm going to give my corn 12 hours to get up out of the ground, but then after that, these late emergers are costing me yield. How much? About 8% yield at 24 hours. I'm giving up a third of my crop at 36, and then it starts becoming a train wreck at 80 to 90 percent losses at 48 and 48 hours plus. So if we could improve that 12-hour emergence, it's going to offer us some yield advantages. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks to all of our Inside PTI subscribers for sending in questions. We've enjoyed talking about them and sharing the information with you today.